Hello. Hello. You're good, right, okay, that's a good first one. I didn't have to train you to do that one. Just very quickly, before I get started, I want to try and see a show of hands as to who already owns a drone. Ooh, a few. Good, hopefully, in the next 18 minutes, I'm going to convince every single one of you to put your hand up. But firstly, it's one of those word games, isn't it? If I say drone, you say... OK, that didn't work so well. I say drone, you say... Fly. You say... Helicopter. Helicopter. Quadcopter. Well, that's the very technical term. You're obviously an owner. Normally, when I say drone, people say bomb. People say war. What people don't say is humanitarian response. What they don't say is delivering food into Syria. All of these things we can do with remotely piloted aircraft. And in the next 17 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey back and a journey forwards. I might have a couple of things I might ask of you, and I might ask you to ask me a couple of things. So firstly, a brief history of drones. Well, in May 1896, some bloke called Samuel decided to chuck this thing off of a wooden boat in the Potomac River in Virginia. Now, if anyone here knows their aviation history, can any of you shout out for me? You see, I like this audience participation thing, right? Can you please shout out for me the year that the Wright brothers flew their plane? 1903. So, <laughs> 1896, we had unmanned aircraft, remotely piloted aircraft before we had manned aviation. Hold on to that thought. This thing is older than manned aviation. Now, there's a prize if anyone who can tell me who this is. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. There is no prize, I lied. <laughs> Sorry, apart from I think you're awesome. Um, this is Marilyn Monroe in her first ever photo shoot. And as a woman, I never thought I would ever have anything in common with Marilyn frickin' Monroe. Except I do. She was a drone engineer in World War II. And if you didn't know that, then that's a good one for Christmas, like, you know, uh, general knowledge quizzes in the family. What did Marilyn do in the war? So she was 19 years old in this photo shoot. She was still called Norma Jean at the time. And I just want to pause for a moment and recognize the fact that if she had wanted to go into an engineering course in the US, she probably would not have been accepted because she was a woman. Marilyn Monroe was an incredibly complex creature from what I understand. She read books that I really don't have time to read. She was incredibly intelligent. And I wonder if maybe her life would have been a bit easier if she hadn't been so bright. Her job in World War II was to spray down the fire retardant and to check the rotary systems on these things called radio planes. Radio planes were used by the US Air Force for dogfighting practice before they went over to Europe uh, for D-Day. So, just hold the phone. Drones or unmanned aircraft are older than manned aircraft, and they also helped us win World War II. And Marilyn Monroe liked them. So that's three nice facts, OK? So, unidentified flying objects. I'm going to run through now some examples of some uses of drone technology, and I don't do this to bore you, but I want to try and spark some ideas, because quite frankly, we need some creativity in the drone industry. Now, on a Friday night, <laughs> I sometimes, and if anyone knows me vaguely well enough, will sit with a glass of wine and Google or YouTube drone stuff. Now, I'm not actually advocating this as a method of tooth extraction. I'm not a dentist by training. I have a PhD, not a medical degree. Um, but this kid seems quite happy that he's about to have the tooth extracted by drone, and it worked. So you can find that on YouTube. <laughs> now, most people might remember this as well. So this was the first time reusable fireworks were really used, right? So drones can be used as reusable, <laughs> reduce, reuse, recycle, reusable fireworks. Well, they've just actually gone ahead and done one with 500. OK, this here is the gimbal. This won the Drones for Good Prize in the UAE a couple of years ago. This is a search and rescue drone, so it's got a carbon fiber cage around it so the blades don't cut you up when it comes looking for you in a collapsed building or a collapsed mine site or a collapsed tunnel. This is the new version of the dog, the rescue dog. This is, this is what it looks like. I also call this, um, though we hate to mention the movie Prometheus because it was such a letdown, there were some good technical things in that movie. If you might remember where they threw the balls up in the air and it went and did this beautiful laser mapping of the structure that they were in. So there were some good things in that movie. This is the grandfather of the Prometheus drone. And then my world ended. As a drone scientist and, a, and an advocate for the good uses of drone technology, Poker Drone came along. 
Well, a couple of years ago, I estimated that we will actually have more drones than smartphones per capita, per family unit in Australia in about five years. And then Poker Drone came along. Now, this was actually a concept kind of drone, but what I found on YouTube again <laughs> was these lads in New York City sat on top of their building, flying a great big massive DJI Inspire, which is like a 20 grand aircraft, over New York City catching Pokemon. Normally, whenever anything drone-related comes on social media, all my friends tag me, so I get it hitting in my timeline like 20 times. I was the first person to see the poker drone, so I was able to dampen that fire across my social media. But in truth, if you think about it, in a family unit, your kids will have a couple of racing drones, Pokemon drones, you'll have your selfie drone, um, your husband or your wife might have their selfie drone or a family drone, you'll have a big drone, a small drone, a delivery drone, eventually your drone will be taking you to work. If you didn't notice, I quite like drones. OK, now these are a couple here that are a little bit ugly, and they look quite similar. And this is where, actually, we need to start thinking a little bit differently. So about 15 years ago, DARPA created a hummingbird drone. And the beauty of the hummingbird drone is that it can move in four directions. So biomimicry in engineering is coming back in fashion. Evolutionary engineering is coming into fashion. So how to engineer things with fewer materials, working out where stress points are and things. Imagine we're looking at these things now and calling them drones. These are the 1980s mobile phones where you're carrying the battery pack with you whilst you're on your phone. Does everyone remember that? that people would literally be carrying one of these massive, great big car batteries effectively whilst talking into their phones. We're now looking at things like wireless charging. Something I've been predicting lately for smart cities is to have blank canvases on buildings because we just don't know what technology we're going to be having in the next few years. So the idea we could have gargoyles now, instead of to ward off evil spirits the way the Victorians did, we'll have gargoyles as communications and charging stations for our delivery drones. Now, just to note, they have actually predicted that first-person view drone racing is going to be worth more than Formula One in the next two years. ESPN have already created a channel for it. If you don't race a drone yet, you should. If you don't have a drone racing team yet, imagine. You could be like you know, the Red Bull racing team in a couple of years' time, all right? So get together and see who wants to form a drone racing team. I might throw a tenner in. One sad point to note at the Australian National Drone Racing Champions, Championships um, in the Gold Coast, there was not one single female entrant. We need to change this. This is drone surfing. So for people <laughs> who like kite surfing and then there's no wind, like my husband, he would quite happily take one of these things and go out on his board and probably do tricks with it. There's also drone fly fishing now, where people fly their drones out looking for the fish and drop the bait over where the fish are. I call that cheating. They call it drone fishing. So to actually go back a little bit in time again, back to 2002, this was the Ikana project by NASA. Now, I just want to look at the way we use words around this technology. The word drone for me means that something's a bit stupid. It means it's following a Borg-like system of resistance is futile and you're taking your control from some in invisible person or network. Ikana is a Choctaw word meaning intelligence. These equipment are more powerful than the things we use to land on the moon in terms of their computing power and their sensory, sensory um, object detection and things like that. We should probably stop calling them drones. I just can't think of a better word. And if there's an audience anywhere in the world right now that can probably come up with a better word than drone, it's this one here. So if you have any ideas on what drones should be called, use the hashtag I am wired for wonder and let's blast social media with some ideas about how we can actually reclaim this word. This one here is a box system where the drone is sat inside it. I can imagine seeing things like this all over our smart farms across Australia. These will be checking your fence lines before you get up in the morning. These will be looking to check all your cows are there, or that there's water in the trough, or that where the weeds are, or to stop cattle rustling. Seriously, there's a thing called cattle rustling still? I didn't even realize that was still a problem. But these babies sit inside a box, and there's robotic arms that swap out the cameras and swap out the batteries, so you don't even need to be anywhere near it. We are now taking humans out of the drone loop. They're becoming autonomous. They're able to talk to each other. They're like Tesla's cars. Take the wheels off the Tesla car, you've got a drone, right? R2-D2, obviously, you have to. I've got an audience. I'm a Star Wars geek. I have to. DJI, the world's largest manufacturer of drones, is in China, up in Shenzhen and they have an R2-D2 drone on Christmas list. Um, in all seriousness, defibrillator drones. 
So we've all been through shopping centres where you've got the defibs on the wall there for people to run to you. Can you imagine if you're living in a big city and the paramedics are stuck in traffic and they can't get to you? This baby can. They've already got them going in trials across Europe at the moment. So defibrillator drones, maybe EpiPen drones. We're now looking at drones to actually deliver medicines to people in remote, rural and regional communities. The number of people that die because they can't get diagnosed and get the drugs quickly enough is actually significant in parts of Australia. We have a solution. Steam. Now, this is called the Nixie. Now, it's been on Kickstarter for over a year. It's on my Christmas list. The Nixie for me is basically a personal selfie wearing wearable drone. Okay, so it's wearable drone technology now. Quite frankly, that thing is ugly. Uh, you know, where's my Saturn Bide drone? Where's my Chanel drone? Where's my Bulgari drone? Where's the skins that I can swap them out? You remember swatch watches where you could change the colours of things to match your outfits? I want one basic wearable with skins that I can put on to match my outfits, right? But moreover, we now in Australia have just developed material that actually generates electricity as you walk. So my jacket could be made of, this is happening, right? This is going to happen in the next year or two. And it's going to happen because you're here. So material that's charging my mobile phone in one pocket and charging my wearable selfie drone on the other. Because we all know on a random Thursday, sometimes when you're walking to work, you just want to take a selfie. You just want to. And how can you? Well, now you can. You take the Nixie off your wrist, you pop it. It's got facial recognition software, the way that the Snapchat filters work. You chuck it in the air. Selfie, no, selfie, no, sel no, selfie. Catch it, put it back on your wrist, and you've got a photograph. Now, there was a chap in the US that unfortunately had a bad day in that he was flying his drone near the White House for a family photograph. Dads love drone selfies, OK? Uh, buy your dad a drone for Christmas. Um, so this guy was taking his photograph, and the thing went cray-cray, and it flew over his head, and it landed in the White House garden. And at that point, you think, where are they going to render me to, really? Um, luckily, he got away with that. Um, but what happened since was now is there's now geofencing technology. So if you try to fly a drone inside Washington, D.C., it will forcibly land. If you try and fly one near an international border, it will land. Anti-drone drones are the new drone. <laughs> but in all seriousness, cybersecurity. So the Internet of Things is something that's incredibly interesting to me because you're only as strong as your weakest link. And as of all of us experienced about a month or so ago, the East Coast US websites were all hacked via somebody's baby monitor. So someone hacked into the networks through someone's Wi-Fi-enabled baby monitor. So if you're using your drones to actually directly download information to your systems, well, how cyber secure are your drones, command and communication? So we're testing our drones now, and you can hack them. Your drones can get hacked. Everything can get hacked, right? But you wouldn't think of it. So now there's this whole backlog of security systems around how we command and control drones. Just very briefly, innovation fusion, a term I came up with in the pub with my mate Mia. She 3D prints organs. I like drone technology. Stick the two together. You've got innovation fusion, where two lines of innovation cross over. So you can 3D print everything now, including drones. And Mia and I are looking at taking 3D printing drone technology or 3D printing applications out to schools, especially lower socioeconomic and rural and regional remote schools, so they can actually build things that I can't even imagine. So there are places to go. This wonderful photograph, and I have to um, acknowledge Eric Cheng for this picture. In Vanuatu, they've actually mapped a live caldera of a volcano using a drone, and at the end, it melted. Thank you, drone. Isn't that so much better than putting a human in there? Though I know some people that would just do it for the thrill, right? Um, but there's places to go, and there's people to see. And there are also stories to be told. And so I would like to take you now to a place called Uluru. And I'm going to show you a quick two-minute clip of some drone footage of Uluru. Now, this is the first, what I would refer to as legal footage of Uluru, because it's been actually produced in partnership with the local storytellers. Everyone else can go and fly their drone and put stuff up on YouTube, but it doesn't mean they've asked permission from anyone to show those sites of cultural significance. This is a question of ethics. This is what geoethics is. What are the ethics of the geospatial data that we are putting straight onto the internet? Enjoy.
Now, for me, the last slide of that was probably the most important, other than the absolutely stunning footage. But if you remember when you were a kid, did you ever have dreams where you could fly? I did. I blame David Attenborough. But we are now able to see things in a hyper-real way. That movie makes me emotional every time I see it. It's absolutely stunning, and it's so significant that we can look at things from the sky. But what's also significant is the fact that we need to live our values. And so if there's one other social media thing I'll ask you to check out whilst you're here, it's a program that I've created in conjunction with a number of other women who are also drone pilots. Because currently, my understanding is that drone pilots are fewer than 1% women. Less than 1% of drone pilots are women. This is the most exciting, egalitarian technology that we've had our hands on in a long, long time. This year in Australia is the first year in 25 years that there are fewer female applicants to our aerospace and aeronautical engineering degree courses. This is the generation that's going to go to Mars. This is the generation that should be embracing this kind of technology. So, at Christmas, buy yourself a drone. Buy your niece a drone. Buy your mum a drone. Just have fun. Follow the rules, be safe, and enjoy the technology and enjoy the data that you can create. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of you. You can find me on LinkedIn or on social media about any ideas that you might have around drones. And I really look forward to hearing those alternative terms of reference. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.